Corey, am I talking to you from the East Coast? Where are you at? You are uh, coming to you live from the Upper West, west Side of uh, scorching hot Manhattan right now. I have heard it is awful. I live in LA, I'm used to the heat, but I have heard you guys are just getting pummeled this year. So I hear, it, I hear it's bad in LA too, which is not something I usually hear about LA weather. Oh, uh, well, we don't have the humidity though. I mean, like, you know, it's it, it's it's a swamp where you are. So, okay, so I see all this art behind you and I guess that works as kind of a pivot are, is there about to be a, a shocking twist here where you reveal to me that you did the art in this film? Oh, or God, you I are... wish. <laughs> I wish. That, the, the one over my, uh, for anyone watching this interview, the one over my uh, left, yeah, this is my left ear, uh, is by William Downs, who is the artist uh, who painted all of Adam's original artwork uh, in the movie. And that was one of the really key collaborators on this movie and, and one of the hardest ones to find. Because um, early on, I knew that this was a movie that's sort of all about this young artist finding his voice and that his art was going to really be a character in the movie. I didn't want to just quickly throw together some, you know, some nice props for his some, some, some set decoration for his, uh, for his art. I really wanted to work with an artist and have sort of a long iterative process of, uh, of, of finding this artist's voice and, and working with an artist who really already kind of have their own developed voice and could could keep some of that while also doing the sort of character work of, of being our character. Um, and William Downs, who lives in Atlanta, is based in Atlanta where we shot, uh, is just such a great artist. As you can maybe see from his piece sort of blurrily in the background there, he mostly works in black and white uh, and mostly in ink and does these kind of monumental uh, drawings on, on often directly on the walls of art galleries. And for this, we kind of convinced William to work in color, which he hadn't done in a very long time. And I think he ended up enjoying that, but it was, uh, it was a way to keep a lot of his sort of core style, which is what attracted me to him as a collaborator, but also uh, make it a little different from his own work, make it something unique to this character. Yeah, it was pretty striking generally throughout you know, it's 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 a visually pretty interesting movie, and obviously one of the aspects that comes with that is these aliens. I imagine you guys didn't have a huge budget, but the aliens are pretty effectively done. So tell me a little bit about the the process of designing and creating this alien race on screen. Yeah, that was it. Was one of the reasons I wanted to do this movie because it was so far from what I'd done before. Um, and it was a real joy. I, I worked with Eric DeBoer, who was our visual effects supervisor. He uh, had had worked with Bong Joon Ho on the uh, the Super Pig in Okja. Oh yeah, which, is, which for me was like a real milestone uh, in in visual effects, where it was the first time I'd really gotten like deeply emotionally invested in a, a fully visual effects character on screen, and and just the even technically the textures and all of that were so convincing, and. Um, so I worked with Eric. He he kind of taught me a lot about uh, how how best to do visual effects. Uh, and because of the COVID delays on this movie, as so many movies experienced, we got a long opportunity to to iterate on creature design and, and really try to kind of simplify uh, over and over again and, and have something that was striking and weird, but not this sort of uh, we didn't want you staring at the alien, sort of marveling at its at its complex you know marvelous physique the, the creature itself is a sort of an annoying almost like a personification of the, the the robot voice on the phone telling you that you're 30th in line to talk to a human and so we wanted a suitably kind of strange almost annoying looking alien and I think Eric did a great job with that well what about um shooting for those creatures on set you know you have scenes where like Tiffany Haddish is supposed to be holding it or yes. you know everyone's interacting with it what did you guys use for stand-ins or were people just talking to an empty space so we had uh, a whole army of of what we call proxies of these little sort of variously shaped uh 3d printed models scale models of the vov there's actually one again for any visual uh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's one hiding under my uh oh. under my See, yeah. it looks cute in this capacity. Yeah. Like, 
it doesn't have its slightly nauseating like uncanny valley human skin tone yeah raw turkey flesh so that makes it a little cuter but um but yeah so we use those the shot that you're talking about where tiffany is wrestling with the alien took a lot of planning and that was uh we actually had eric taking a, a sort of limbless version of the proxy and had a a uh, he had like a basically like a broomstick attached to it and was sort of uh perturbing this and cause, so that Tiffany actually had something to resist rather than just needing to shake it or do all the acting herself and um and yeah so it was and and for some of the shots just as a VFX necessity you have to pull the proxies and actually get the basically the pixels behind the thing for for the animators to work with but uh but yeah so there was it was all kinds of different setups uh depending on the scene it was all heavily choreographed now, what about their language? Um, it's it's a running joke that nobody could, no human could even begin probably to to actually speak it. So, uh, tell me about working with your sound team and creating the Voth language. This that's a very good impression. We should we could have saved a lot of money just by having. You <laughs> there. Um, but so that was that actually started even before the the sound exploration started even before we got really deep into the visual exploration. And that was also um, Eric DeBoer's idea, our, our visual effects supervisor. He he said, you know, usually the sound is the last piece. You get these amazing visual effects creatures. And then when you have like almost your final version, you pass it over to Foley and they give you the roars and squeaks and all that. But this really was a character that, and this these have a lot of dialogue. Um, and so he thought it would be cool to treat it like a human performer where you get a, you know, you get a voiceover and then you animate to that. So another key collaborator was Gene Park, who's been my my sound mastermind, uh, supervising sound mixer, sound editor, sound designer uh, for every movie I've done so far. And he was really inventive about getting in there with a great Foley team early on and just experimenting with getting different strange rubbing sounds and then adding layers of audio processing and speed changes and all of that. But trying to make something that felt like organic and not just sort of a like weird alien, vague sci-fi sounds, but still sounded like nothing uh, that we that we could recognize here on Earth. Oh, OK. Yeah, I, re I remember his work in Thoroughbreds, you know, for years, the sound of that rowing machine <laughs> has stuck with me thematically. Yes, you know, he's, he's um, a key collaborator for sure. Yeah, amazing work there. So, you know, I kind of jumped ahead, but what drew you to this book in the first place? Yeah, uh, so some of it was, I'm, I'm very reactive to what I've done most recently. So coming off of Bad Education, which was a very, um, essentially, it was a dark comedy, but essentially a realistic kind of character drama, dark, you know, crime story. Um, I wanted something that was very, very far from that, that had a real kind of unabashed genre element. Um, and what I loved about this book was that it it had this very kind of cerebral, but also very goofy and bizarre and funny idea at its core, which is this notion of kind of a purely economic alien invasion, like a free market alien invasion, where there's no force used other than the forces of, of you know, basic economics. And, uh, and, and, and I love the way that the book talked about kind of, you know, good, good old, good old fashioned capitalism and, and also, uh, you know, sort of ideas of colonialism, cultural appropriation. It took on a lot of these very weighty ideas, but in a very playful way. And I, and I was drawn to the fact that it seemed very hard to adapt, frankly, that it was, uh, that, that it was just going to force me to use very different muscles than I'd ever used on, on previous movies. Did you follow the book's structure pretty closely or did you kind of rejigger it a lot? I think overall, it? yeah, it's, it's, it, there, are, there are a number of differences in the book and I, I encourage anyone who liked or even disliked the movie to read the book because it's such a great book. But um, it's, I think overall we kept the structure and I certainly tried to be very, almost more than the structure, I wanted to be very true to its tone. And it has this very, uh, very kind of specific, almost world weary, Sort of, sort of a you know, it's very much from a through teenage eyes, and and it has almost that like catcher in the rye concern with authenticity, um, but it has this very funny, incredibly dark satirical sort of world weary tone that I wanted to to keep in the movie. Yeah, so this uh, honestly, 
thinking about this world and this possibility made me pretty depressed. What do you see um, in in the world you created long term? What do you see happening? Because I have to imagine eventually there just won't be enough humans left to consume the products the aliens have created, right? And it, it it's kind of tapped into my existential dread about where capitalism is going and, you know, we keep automating everything until there's no one left to consume the goods. What's happening in this world, ultimately? Yeah, I mean, it's very, I think you 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 put it well. I think it's a bleak future, for sure. It's a bleak present in the movie and an even bleaker uh, future. And and it was compelling to me in a, in a dark way, this idea of a world that, like, where, where, you know, nefarious forces would be able to take over without firing a shot. It's not a hostile takeover. Humans uh, accept this situation step by step, uh, each time thinking their lives are improving until they kind of wake up one day and realize their lives are horribly not improved. And I think there are, it's obviously a blown up, um, over the top version of some of the things happening today, but I think there are, there are, uh, there are points of comparison there. And I think, yeah, when you talk about like there being no one left to consume, you look at, you know, towns, uh, Appalachian towns that were coal mining, uh, you know, coal mining epicenters that just get abandoned when when the coal leaves. And I guess in this case, the, the main resource that Earth is providing to the, the interplanetary empire is uh, is humanity. There's the resource is, you know, love. Consumers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, and eventually they'll probably get tired of that and, and move on. Um, but, you know, as bleak as this is all sounding, I did for, for that reason, it was important that there's a glimmer of hope uh, at the end of the movie. And it's not just doesn't just fall into kind of an easy nihilism. And so I did want the ending to, to feel like, a, a, you know, not, not, a, 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 not a rose colored glasses sort of ending, but a feeling of, of uh, at least a sort of an exaltation of that which makes us human. and the the importance of making art and doing things that matter to you uh for its own sake essentially yeah i mean that that's that's relief the idea that art can triumph in all this and obviously i don't want to get spoilery if anyone hasn't watched yes, yes, yes. the film but hopefully that's um, enough. there were some other aspects about the world you built i thought that were interesting um little details like when we go up to this kind of rich floating world the aliens have for themselves one of the secretaries we have this whole scene where she's putting this like oily sheen on herself what why okay unpack that <laughs> so it's a great there used to be a little bit there were more scenes kind of unpacking that but i was really drawn to this idea again from the book that that uh the tiny handful of humans that form this new shrunken upper class like the very small number of them that can be sort of directly in business with the aliens that those humans become kind of culturally corrupted by their proximity to, to power and that you know that which is powerful becomes that which is sexy so these tiny bizarre looking aliens that have to wear goo on their body so that they don't dry out and dehydrate in our earthly environment that becomes the height of fashion so people want to look and sound and behave more above like less human like because that's those are the rich people those are the rich things <laughs> and uh and so uh in the book they actually had like full shaved heads and i didn't want to quite go there for all, all sorts of reasons but <laughs> the idea that people shave their eyebrows to be as hairless as possible like the above and that a few of them actually start putting on this this anti-drying aid uh even though it's completely unnecessary for them i thought was a funny subversive idea did you actually have poor Michael Gandolfini shave his eyebrows for this? No, he was, let the record show, he was very willing to do it. And, <laughs> uh, but uh, he just had such beautiful eyebrows. I couldn't, I couldn't part with them. So he, our, <laughs> our amazing hair and makeup team gave him, uh, you know, some great looking fake uh, shaved eyebrows. So I don't even know what to say I expect a Corey Finley movie is going to be, but uh, so I have no idea what to expect next. Any ideas from you? What are you working on next? Because yeah, I mean, as as is always the case, I guess, in, in the ever more uh, complex terrain of, of trying to get movies made in Hollywood, there are a number of projects. We'll see what kind of uh, is the next one up, but uh, I'm definitely interested uh, it, as I said before, I'm like very restless. So I don't think I'll do another sci-fi project next. Um, this was less about 
crossing sci-fi off my list and more about just loving the book's strange approach to these um to these to these issues and wanting to do something genre um but i'm you know i'll say the psychological thriller genre which can mean many things is kind of calling my calling my name again um but in in a different form so we'll see we'll see what happens and obviously we need to resolve these uh these these very worthy union fights before anything yeah. can continue but uh but yeah there will be more in the future well, I can't wait to see that. And obviously, you uh, you know, you you have a knack for bringing about interesting up and coming actors and uh, pretty memorable plots. So I look forward to seeing what that has. Before I go, I wanted to tell you a fun anecdote about this. When I watched uh, a screening of this, I had not done my research on it at all. In fact, when I first watched it, I hadn't even. Um, I, I didn't even check to see it was you who directed it. So when it started, I thought it was a kid's movie. And so it's like eight minutes in and then the dude blows his brains <laughs> out on screen. It's like, yeah, oh my really God. Spoiler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love, I love, uh, I wish more people could walk in, you know, uh, to movies with no idea of what to expect. Cause one of my great pleasures is in the rare cases, like you're saying, where I haven't seen a trailer or don't know anything about a movie. I love just being knocked sideways by, genre shifts so i hope a few people can have that experience and that they're not too traumatized by it <laughs> well thank you so much Corey. uh you know good luck with the promo with this and with whatever film you give us next i can't wait to see it thank you so much really appreciate it